acknowledging the Creator, who is the source of all life, power, and health, acknowledging our ancestors in particular, our most recent ancestor, Dr. John Henry Clark, acknowledging our queen, Nzinga, the president of the Association for the Study of Classical African Civilization, acknowledging the work, workers who have put together the conference, acknowledging Morris Brown College for being the home and the place of a spirit of African love and destiny. I got a letter dated July 24th from the president of the Association for the Study of Classical African Civilization. And it is because of that letter that I shaped my presentation for this afternoon. Uh, she is a vigilant person situated in a place where you can see trends, where you can see things happening all over the country and um, in fact all over the world and I want to share with you some parts of that letter thank you very much and then I have some fairly specific things to say in response to it she said uh, dear colleague and this letter went out to a number of those of us in ASCAC, so I'm not the only one that got the letter. She said, we know you're busy, but it's a critical time that you take out five minutes to read this letter. We are writing about the growing assault against Afrocentricity as a discipline and a recent attack against your work on black history and culture. We believe that it is imperative that black scholars organize an effective offensive to address these issues. But before we consider this, let us first clarify the nature of the problem. Then she cites, number one, Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas recently stated in an interview that he avoids hiring as law clerks applicants who have taken courses on race or African American studies. Uh, and then she attached the news article where Clarence Thomas is quoted as having made that statement. Two, the University of California Regent Ward Connery, who campaigned for an end to race-based college admissions in California, has called on the University of California system to re-examine ethnic studies programs and other race or ethnic-based pursuits. And of course, what you know that means is the hope for elimination of those departments and courses where African people have an opportunity to do the research to study themselves. And as you know, Ward Connery is uh, a Negro regent. Uh, Mr. At number three, Mr. Eric Martell, who is a high school teacher in Washington, D.C., has written to thousands of schools in the United States condemning Afrocentricity. And in his letter, he provides a list of black authors from Tony Browder to Francis Cress Welsing and their publications and requests that the teachers and administrators remove these works from classroom libraries. So it's not just Tony and Francis, but if you saw the list, it's almost everybody that you read. Uh, that those are the books, Dr. Clark's book, Dr. Jopp's book, uh, Dr. Uh, or, uh, John Jackson's books. Those are the books that were identified on this list and this letter actually went out, I have copies of the letter, asking that those books be removed. In other words, that Africans and no one else should have access to the writings. And it's a high form of censorship, of course. Then she says, number four, since 1989, every major newspaper, magazine, and journal, as well as countless television and radio talk shows, have engaged in a broad-gauged, unilateral assault 
against Afrocentricity. Only one major magazine has provided a proponent of Afrocentricity an opportunity to publish his opinion. Uh, so if you listen to talk radio, if you listen, and if you read, you'll know that uh, our president was confirmed in what she said. Uh, the attacks have been going on actually for a long time, at least for a decade in a fairly intense way. Number five, several books have also been written attacking Afrocentricity. Among those are the book by Arthur Schlesinger, The Disuniting of America, which has a rogues gallery with pictures of some of the uh, African scholars, including mine, I might add, uh, and an argument that the African scholars are responsible for pulling the nation apart by the mere fact that African tradition is studied. Uh, the book, Not Out of Africa, by Mary Lefkowitz, which challenges the uh, fundamental notion that Africans are Africans, <laughs> that those people in the Nile Valley who erected pyramids were actually African people. Presumably, they were Europeans who managed in their spare time to leave home and come to Africa and build things in Africa that they were never capable of building at home. And after building them, then they went home and forgot about the fact that they had built them. And then there is Black Athena Revisited, edited by uh, Mary Lefkowitz. I'm not sure if it's Mary Lefkowitz only, but I think there were two authors of that. And then there's the book The End of Racism by Dinesh D'Souza, who comes from the country that gave us the caste system uh, in India and is now telling us that there is no racism in America. He, um, something that I'll say about him and others in a moment. And then finally, uh, Sister Nzinga speaks about Stephen Howe, an Oxford scholar who has written a new book, and this one has just come out, called Afrocentrism, Mythical Past and Imagined Homes. She says, this is by far the most comprehensive, provocative, and demeaning assault against black scholarship ever published. It is a dangerous attack on most of the work of our elders and on most of our contemporary scholars. Because of the way it is marketed, we believe that the author and publisher expect African Americans to purchase the book and trigger a national controversy by our response to it. Although we believe that the book must be critiqued, we are urging black people not to publish it. You say, how did I get it? Well, you borrow a copy from the library. I can't tell you to Xerox it because that would be illegal. I said I can't tell you to Xerox it because that would be illegal. <laughs> In addition to the above, many of our black studies programs and departments are threatened with, distinction, with extinction. In fact, some are already extinct. <laughs> some of the core African studies part, departments are extinct. Those that are most African are those that are in greatest at greatest risk of being extinct, even as those that advertise themselves not to be African are being more fully funded. In spite of the growing threat to our publication and discipline, few black scholars have spoken out in defense of our tradition and our work. It is the opinion of the ASCAG board that this state of black indifference and denial in the face of growing menace that could destroy everything we have fought for can no longer be sustained. We must fight. Now that's in bold. That, that's bold, so I said it that way. <laughs> in the spirit of Dr. Clark, Dr. John Jackson, Dr. Chancellor Williams, and countless others who have joined our ancestors. So here in Los Angeles, we have formed a steering committee of ASCAG to address the issues above. We've already outlined a national plan of action, but before finalizing it, we want to convene a meeting, and they talk about the meeting and when it would be called and where. So it is uh, in part in response to that that uh, I would like to add some information and some perspectives of my own because if we truly understand the nature of the struggle that we are a part of, 
It's really not a struggle per se about information. It's a struggle per se about unity, about bonding, about the connections of the African family to itself. That has always been the problem. Our existence as a people is what the problem is. The matter of information and the attack on our information about ourselves is a symptom of the old problem that Europeans have of attempting to find a way to destroy the unity in the African community. And so we came into this world evolved as members of families, either little families or big families. Sometimes we call them tribes, sometimes we call them nation. Uh, more appropriately, perhaps in the language of today, we should call them ethnic groups, the group of family that has a bond and the glue or the bond is really the shared cultural heritage, the shared memories of the group. But what I wanted to do was to try to put in perspective this attack that uh, is identified in this letter from our president. Um, most of the people mentioned in the attack come from a common group of people. In fact, what I would ask you to do if you have a piece of paper, just so that you can keep track of this, and also so that you can accept an assignment that I will suggest after I have finished. Uh, I apologize for not having this on a handout or on an overhead, but I think you'll see that it will work okay. I want you to draw a little rectangle at the top of the paper. If you have line paper, the rectangle should cover about part of two lines because you're going to have some things coming down under this. And in that rectangle, I want you to write the Heritage Foundation. The Heritage Foundation. Now, some of you know what the Heritage Foundation is, founded in 1973. And it was the group that gave Ronald Reagan his blueprint for action. Recently, the Heritage Foundation has published a book that you ought to have, and it is called The Power of Ideas. In that book, they brag that beginning in 1980, they shaped the national agenda at, at about 80% level. About 80% of the national agenda was shaped by the Heritage Foundation. They told Reagan what his blueprint would be, and a dutiful actor that he was, he read his script. And in reading his script, initiated certain things which include us. I'll get to us in just a moment. Because you may wonder, what has the Heritage Foundation got to do with us? Uh, you'll see it has a great deal to do with us. The Heritage Foundation, and you should draw some lines at an angle off the top of your box so that you can write the names of some of the people who gave millions of dollars to the Heritage Foundation to do its work. You should, uh, on the first line that you draw, put Coors Beer, Adolf Coors, Adolf. We had another Adolf in history. Coors Beer, Adolf Coors leading funder of right-wing causes. Got in trouble because of some of the advertisement that Coors Beers was making. They had to back up and then now they come out with a calendar for Black History Month, but don't be mistaken what the agenda is. Scafie family. You recognize the Scafie family because they're behind the uh, support of Kenneth Starr in the attack on the current president of the United States. So these are people, and we're talking about foundations that have hundreds of millions of dollars to spend on their agenda. The Bradley Foundation from Milwaukee, hundreds of millions of dollars to spend, and Coors, Gaffey, and Bradley all contribute to heritage. The John Olin Foundation, 
hundreds of millions of dollars to spend, and it also contributes, contributes to the Heritage Foundation. So if you'll put on those top lines, Coors, Scafe, S-C-A-I-F-E, Bradley, and Olin. Um, now I want to tie some of these, th these together with some of the things that were mentioned in the book and with the mission of ASCAC, because whether you know it or not, there, to my knowledge, there is no group of scholars anywhere in the world currently under attack for writing their history other than the Africans who are working in the United States and in England mainly. Nobody else is under attack for writing their history. And let me say this, everybody who writes their history, no matter who it is, will be under attack. I'm talking about every African who writes their history will be under attack. At one point, uh, one of the strategies was to make it seem that it was a group of rump scholars who didn't know what they were talking about that were making all these wild claims about the study of ancient Egypt and that Egyptians were people who were black people. Uh, Brother Obadeli Williams and I did an article once called The Struggle to Bring True African History into Being, and that's published as an occasional paper of ASCAC, and in it, the names of those scholars who have always taken this position, going back to Martin Delaney, W.E.B. Du Bois, and so forth, the scholars who, with the so-called impeccable credentials, whatever that means, have always argued, if they have studied that question, that the Africans of the Nile Valley were black people. Didn't know, and I also wrote another article called Bringing My Art uh, for the Journal of African Civilization because they were floating this notion around on their propaganda machine that uh, it was only a handful of guys who were out here and few women writing uh, this kind of material. And in fact, what we found is the overwhelming opinion of those who have studied this, uh, it was very clear that uh, uh, we were simply in keeping with a long tradition, buttressed by new information, uh, which is even more compelling than our ancestors had when they began to do these things. Now, the Heritage Foundation has had people working for it. Murray work for the Heritage Foundation, Charles Murray. Okay, in case you don't get it, Charles Murray is the one that wrote several books, two, one called Losing Ground, which was a study that intended to frighten white people that they were losing ground to black people as we got more freedom. But the one that we all know is the book The Bell Curve. So The Bell Curve was funded in part by the Bradley Foundation who funds the Heritage Foundation, a place where Murray also works. Stick with me now. So you put Murray's name down there, draw a little line between him and the Bradley Foundation and the Heritage Foundation, and also on the right side of your paper, draw a little box for the American Enterprise Institute, which is also funded by some of these same foundations that fund the Heritage Foundation. American Enterprise Institute, and it has some interesting activities, people, and publication to its credit. So Murray is in all three places. He's in, he's in the Bradley Foundation, he's in the Heritage Foundation, and he's also at the American Enterprise Institute. And his book, The Bell Curve, argues that blacks are genetically inferior to white people, and that poor people are genetically inferior to rich people. The Heritage Foundation and the American Enterprise Institute, so you have to have two lines for this person next, is Dinesh D'Souza, the same man that I said came from India who gave us the caste system. Dinesh D'Souza wrote a book called Illiberal Education, which was effectively an attempt to establish a core curriculum of Western civilization and to attack anybody who wanted to study themselves. Um, Dinesh D'Souza used to be at, uh, I believe it was Princeton, as editor of a student newspaper, and he was a right-winger then. What was it? Dartmouth. Dartmouth, Dartmouth right. Editor of a student newspaper and a right-winger then. And he also wrote a book, The End of Racism. 
the end of racism, which argues that there is no more racism. Now, Janesh D'Souza has ties to the Heritage Foundation, also to the American Enterprise Institute, and when that last book was published, it was so stinky and ugly that two black conservatives who were at the American Enterprise Institute gave up their membership in the Institute. That's Robert Woodson and Glenn Laurie. Now, you know, it's really something when black conservatives will give up their spot <laughs> in right-wing institutions. <laughs> But this was so ugly that they quit over that book. And that's Janesh D'Souza. And, and we'll come back to the American Enterprise Institute in just a second. Bennett, who was former Secretary of Education and actually, in addition to that, formerly head of the Endowment for the Humanities, has argued that E.D. Hirsch's book, Cultural Literacy, which outlines the 4,000 things that everybody is supposed to know, which is really a reaffirmation of Western civilization and a negation of African civilization, because we have a little pepper in there. They'll say something about Martin Luther King, something about uh, Ange Maya Angelou and stuff like that. But no story of African people in the book by Harris Cultural Literacy, but Bennett, who worked for the Heritage Foundation, and who was then Secretary of Education said they should use that book's content in order to determine who would have admission to college. Get rid of the SAT and have them study Western civilization, in other words. That was Bennett's thing. Now, Bennett was also head of the Endowment for the Humanities when the black psychologist submitted a videotape that I do called Free Your Mind, Return to the Sword, thinking that they were going to get funding from the Endowment for the Humanities <laughs> to produce that show. Well, I told them beforehand they weren't going to do it, but they insisted, so we created a little 30-minute pilot. And, of course, we were immediately rejected because they said they didn't do that kind of funding. But immediately after that, they came out with a film called The Africans with Ali Missouri editing the film. But Ali Missouri, remember now, his point was that we were not one people, we were three people. We had a triple heritage. That's why he was attractive to the funding agency. So they were willing to fund a book about history and a movie about history, which showed all over, when they thought that the main message of Ali Missouri was going to be this triple heritage. I'm part Arab, I'm part African. Part European, that's what he said. Sounds like the Tiger Woods syndrome. <laughs> so uh, when Ali Missouri also was determined to be anti-colonial, so if you follow his series, he didn't get in trouble until they got to the part where he got to the anti-colonial in earnest. And that's when they took his series off of television. Now Bennett, was, this Heritage Foundation person, was the one who was at the endowment when these uh, two attempts to say something about African people uh, were launched. Also, at the American Enterprise Institute, a person named Linda Chavez worked there. I don't know if you know anything about, you remember her? She was on the Civil Rights Commission and she's anti-civil rights. But she also wrote a book called Alternatives to Afrocentrism. Now, how does a person who has never written anything about African history suddenly become an authority sufficient to edit a book on the alternative to Afrocentrism? What are they talking about? They're talking about alternative to the destruction of black civilization, alternative to civilization or barbarism, alternative to Ivan Van Sertima's They Came Before Columbus, alternative to the information. Now, the information, by the way, is uh, strategically never touched. What is done with the information that we produce is that we're characterized. There's a difference between reading and engaging and disputing and documenting and challenging documentation and characterizing a work. Say, this work is just no good. In fact, they had one young man named Frank Yerko who reviewed the Portland Baseline Essays in Oregon that we wrote, and Dr. Clark wrote one of those essays, and this fool 
who never finished his degree at the University of Chicago, said that Dr. Clark's essay was worthless as history. This is a man who has no skills, no background in African history, but categorically characterized the work of Dr. Clark. Because you, can't, you cannot argue the work of Dr. Clark. You got to read as much as he reads. And in his, if he had 20 lifetimes, Yerko could not read as much as Dr. Clark read. The American Enterprise Institute, followed by the Olin Foundation. Now remember, the Olin Foundation is one of the funders of the Heritage Foundation. The Olin Foundation has an interesting history. You notice that I'm only picking out foundations that are attacking the content of African studies. That's all I'm doing. They do a lot of other things, too. For example, these are the same people that are anti-public schools. They're anti-voucher, or they're pro-voucher, pro-choice, pro-decentralization. So that's a whole other set of agendas that they have. And you need to pick up this book by the Heritage Foundation on the power of ideas in order to understand what their full agenda is. But remember, Olin, who funds Heritage, also is a foundation where the man who used to be the executive director of Olin now becomes the executive director of the Bradley Foundation. I'm trying to tie all these foundations together. They're tied together because they have the common agenda of trashing African people's attempt to study themselves. The Olin Foundation funds a book by Mary Lefkowitz, Not Out of Africa. Not Out of Africa. You see what they have in common. The, the, the attack, a book like Alternatives to Afrocentrism, a book like uh, Closing of the American Mind, which was also funded by the Olin Foundation. So there are two major anti-African books funded by the Olin Foundation, John M. Olin Foundation. Closing of the American Mind was written by a professor who had been at, uh, uh, up in New York, uh, What's the name of the New York University? I'm blocking on it right now. Not Stony Brook. Uh, where Jim Turner is. Cornell, Cornell. The Olin Foundation, Olin was on the board of directors of Cornell when the black students took over the president's office and de with guns and demanded that African studies be taught. One of the angry professors at Cornell was a man named Bloom. Bloom was then given by Olin the money to publish the book, The Closing of the American Mind. You ought to get the book, The Closing of the American Mind, and see what it says about African studies. It's one of the most vicious attacks on African studies. It said that the universities gave in in the 60s and allowed black people to come in and establish their coursework and it stimulated the brown people and the red people. Everybody started asking for the opportunity to study themselves and that destroyed the idea, actually it destroyed the myth of Western civilization. That's what it destroyed. Because there's somebody else who has civilization. There's not just one civilization in the world. There's many, many more civilizations than one. And most people weren't even trying to attack Western civilization. They were trying to attack Western civilization's attack on African civilization. So the Olin Foundation funds this angry professor who then goes to Chicago and publishes his book, The Closing of the American Mind. Now you need to know what happens to these books. The Closing of the American Mind, it was actually very popular when I got out here in Georgia. Presidents of colleges all over America had this book and they call meetings of their faculty. You know, I don't remember the whole time I've been in academe, another time where presidents have called whole faculty meetings so that someone could discuss a book. And this book was about the threat to the content of the curriculum of colleges and universities. Closing of the American mind. And then, of course, not out of Africa. We've also had another book that is highly recommended and is uh, tossed around in academic circles, and that's a book by E.D. Hirsch, Cultural Literacy, which argues that 
not so much that the black curriculum is wrong, but the white one is right. And that if you say, if you establish what the white one is, then that will leave out any room for this, uh, this other curriculum that African people are talking about. Now there's another book that followed out of uh, Lefkowitz's book funded by the Olin Foundation, and that book is called Black Athena Revisited. And the purpose of that book was to get Bernal, see, because they had one white guy that looked like he was agreeing with us, and so they had to wipe him out or attempt to wipe him out. Actually, there were more than that if they had known their history. There were, you know, Godfrey Higgins, they had uh, Gerald Massey, and they had a whole lot of other people, including Basil Davidson, who gradually had begun to, uh, uh, to move up with some kind of support. But that's not the issue for us. The issue for us is what it is that we want to say about ourselves. Now, let me say this. The Heritage Foundation, just so that we'll stay in tune, uh, is the home of Clarence Thomas. So Clarence Thomas's ideas existed before Clarence Thomas became socialized by the Heritage Foundation. In fact, I know when he got introduced to the Heritage Foundation. 1980, there's a book called The Fairmont Papers. And there are about 15 or 20 Africans who were called to a meeting on African leadership, black leadership, and black history by white people. <laughs> And the person who called the meeting, who chaired it at least, was Ed Meese from the Reagan administration. So can't you see this? A meeting about the new black agenda being called by the right-wing Republicans, chaired by Ed Meese, to which all these brothers went to audition. One of those who auditioned at that meeting was Clarence Thomas, Clarence Pendleton, Tony Brown, uh, what's, uh, I think Thomas Sowell was there or something. There were names that you would recognize. And so right after that meeting in 1980, many of these people became very prominent. They could get on any kind of television program, write any kind of book, publish any kind of thing they wanted to publish, because they're supporting what? The ideology developed in these right-wing foundations. For example, Clarence Thomas argued that some of his legal positions are rationalized by a position on uh, natural rights. You have to go back into Heritage Foundation documents to find out when natural rights became the primary theoretical basis upon which public policy and law should be based. It's a little hard for me to believe that Clarence Thomas came up with some of this stuff on his own out of Pinpoint, Georgia. <laughs> Thomas Sowell and Walter Williams, these are all people who are associated with these foundations. Now there's a, there's a, there are a number of, uh, of writings where what I'm saying has been laid out. For example, there's a book called The Manufactured Crisis by David Berliner. It has a chapter in it as to why it is that certain kind of attacks are being made on public education and what is the role of these different people in it. In fact, it dissects the right wing and tells you all three branches of the right wing, names, Organization, just like I'm telling you right now, what the name of the organization is, what its program is, what its publications are, and these are things that we need to know. In other words, if you don't understand where the source of the problem is located, then you might take one of these people who are peripheral to the whole operation, go after that person, <laughs> and the source is still intact. That's why I'm saying these things. Let me, let me give you an example of one publication in addition to the one I just mentioned. Uh, there's an outfit called Rethinking Schools. This last one is called Selling Out, Selling Out Our Schools. But it has a lot of articles in here on the right wing. And let me say this. Just because I'm talking about the right wing doesn't mean the left wing is any better. <laughs> let me just say that. Don't believe that just because the right wing is the one that is prominent right now in the overt anti-African bias that the left wing is any better. Both wings have no interest whatsoever in having us recover our historical memory. And they will do whatever they have to do. Schlesinger comes from the left with his book, Disuniting of America.
The Center for Educational Reform, a relatively new organization, at the center, it's headed by Jeannie Allen, a former analyst for the Heritage Foundation. Okay. Its emphasis includes vouchers, privatization. The center also helped form the Educational Leaders Council, a group of conservative school board chiefs and state board members that's based in Washington, D.C. Remember now, everyone, I, what I'm trying to illustrate by calling names is the fact that it is not a foundation. It is not even the collective of the foundations separately. It's the interlocking network of people within those foundations that have a grand strategy that's being executed as manifest in at least their publication records, but also in the propaganda that goes out over talk radio, propaganda that goes out in news magazines and so forth. Here's another one. Center for the Study of Popular Culture, founded in 1988 by former left leftists, these guys used to be on the left wing, David Horowitz and Peter Collier. This center is the pit bull of right wing think tanks. It focuses, now notice where they focus. See, some of these think tanks focus on things like uh, flat tax, that's Steve Forbes. And you got some right wingers that are in there with him. But I'm not worried about those. What I'm concerned about are these that have cultural agendas. And what cultural agenda means? Anti-African agenda. So that they have in this Center for the Study of Popular Culture, it focuses on cultural uh, issues, and it led to the attack on the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the National Endowment for the Arts. Remember when they wanted to take all the money away? Because they didn't mind their people getting grants, but they didn't want our people to get grants. The Educational Excellence Network, listen at the names of these. The Educational Excellence Network, a project of the Hudson Institute. You're gonna see brothers tied up in the Hudson Institute. The network was founded in 1982 by Chester Finn and Diane Ravage, Miss Daisy. Diane Ravage, the network, remember Diane Ravage is the one that attacked the Portland Baseline Essays. She was the one that attacked the multicultural curriculum. Uh, Lynn Jeffries in New York, when they were trying to put that together, she was the main pit bull. Now she has something, or I remember right after that, in fact, I went to one of those meetings, left the meeting, and I uh, caught the, uh, uh, a radio show where they were reading from this Educational Excellence Network, and until that time, she had not known anything about the Portland Baseline Essay. Didn't realize that we had already had Dr. Clark, Van Sertum, uh, Julian Ewell, a whole bunch of people out in Portland. We have put a whole curriculum together outlining the story of African people from the beginning of time to the present. So in, instead of being able to block that, it was already in place. Then they had to figure out how they could unravel that. And so they began, then, these same people, began an attack in Portland until they finally destroyed the Office of Multicultural Education with Carolyn Leonard. And effectively block the further development of the uh, uh, curriculum effort. But by that time, we had already got our stuff out, and it's all over the world. Uh, so Chester Finn and Diane Rabbit, this network emphasizes privatization, vouchers, charters, standards, and a, quote, core curriculum centered on Western civilization using the work of E.D. Hirsch, and it included in people like Al Shanker, who was head of the teachers union, which is in large urban areas, largely African. And so we began to find AFT putting out anti-African uh, arguments against the infusion of African content in school curriculum. Some of the bitterest papers came out of that area. And here we find uh, that Shanker himself is a part of the Educational Excellence Network and Dennis Doyle, who is based in Indianapolis. Let's look at the uh, Hudson Institute, founded in 1961. It's an old one. For many years, Hudson focused on national security, international affairs. It now also has a strong emphasis on domestic issues, including education. And in Hudson is Chester Finn. We just heard about him over here in the other foundation. And who else? Bill Bennett, who we just heard about from 
the Heritage Foundation, who used to be Secretary of Education. Remember what I said, it's one small family of people that give the impression of being hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people. It's just a set of interlocking networks. And then, just a couple more, the Bradley Foundation. Its president is Michael Joyce. He heads the Lynn and Harry Bradley Foundation out of Milwaukee, considered the ideological leader of the Conservative Foundation. In 1994, it had assets of $389 million and it approved roughly $23 million in grants. So they're living off the interest of these hundreds of millions and on the interest of the hundreds of millions able to fund their anti-African propaganda efforts. The John M. Olin Foundation, which also contributed to, remember Bradley and Olin contributed to Heritage, founded in 1953 by John Olin of the Olin Corporation, a chemical and industrial company. This foundation, based in New York City, had assets of $122 million in 95, and it made grants of $16 million in 1995, in that year. And then, of course, there's the Scapey Foundation, there's other foundations. This is not, uh, it, by any means, an exhaustive list of the foundation. You know. Now, here's one of my challenges. One of my challenges is that, uh, see, one of the things that you could do, if what they've tried to do with their strategy, is to tie down the African scholar. See, if, if if they take some little poot butt scholar, comes up with a jumped up book, and then all the African scholars go over there to try to chase this one person, then when, when, when we get there and beat them up, uh, then there's somebody else that will be sent out. Another pit bull will be sent out. In the meantime, you can't do your reading, you can't do your writing. The very thing that caused them to create their attacks in the first place you know, will be diminished. That is the production of the scholarship that tells the truth about African people. It is the falsehood that causes us to be divided against ourselves. And it is because of the systematic attention to propaganda that we have been able to be injured as we have. And so one of the things that I want to say is that there's a lot of people in ASCAC always want to know, what can I do? And some will do the same kind of things you've seen the scholars do. You become scholars and do that, but there's other work to be done. It's also scholarly. For example, I just gave you the skeleton of the names of a set of foundations. I can see a whole board <laughs> as big as that wall with all these foundations on it, with the board of directors on it, with the names of the people who are the uh, writers, with the publications that they've done, with the lines that tie them together. Why? So that our people can understand the nature of the battle that we're in. We don't understand that because we don't have the big picture. And we think it's some little poot butt person over here in the corner that's coming up. Like, how is a poot butt? He's from Oxford. But that's part of the strategy, too. See, the strategy started out about 15 years ago. Most of the attacks on African scholarship came from the newspaper editorial, magazine editorial, talk show host. That's usually the first line of attack. Think of it as a well-organized army. The army sends out the Marines first, but they got all this Navy. They got all, uh, all this army laid back in wait. They're not ready to commit those forces yet. It's the same thing where we're going here. The first thing we saw were all these poop butt editorials. John Leo in a magazine. Somebody fed him information, and then he comes out and says, in fact, John Leo came to the Infusion Conference at Obadella and and uh, Lucretia Payton and I organized uh, some years ago um, here in Atlanta. And if you, in, in the second year, we had 2,000 people here. We had Theophil Obinga here as the keynote speaker. And John Leo was sitting in the audience. I didn't even know he was sitting in the audience, but came back and wrote this article, but he couldn't say what Obinga said. That was the place where Obinga de delivered the lecture, The African Origin of Philosophy. Now you go back and read the lecture and see if the lecture matches the editorial. <laughs> see, all Leo could say was, Obinga trashed the Greeks. He didn't trash the Greeks. All he said was, this is what Africans did. And they did it before the Greeks, and the Greeks came and learned from the Africans. So if the Greeks were trashed, the Greeks trashed themselves. 
It's very simple. He didn't trash the Greek, but he did not give this powerful argument that Obinga had given right there at the conference. So that's kind of the first line of attack on the African family, to send out the poot butt troops, those people who don't have background, but who are in a position to make noise. The second thing they did was to identify scholars who had a reputation, but not in the field that they were criticizing. Remember a guy who used to be a historian, an American historian, his, his specialty was the history of the United States. I think his name was O'Neill from the University of Chicago. He didn't know anything about Kemet, but he's trying to criticize scholars who write about Kemet. And he's trying to use the prestige that he had earned over here in American history to comment about Kemetic history. Stupid! For anybody who knows anything about it. Then, of course, they moved into using people who knew something about Egypt, like Yurko. Frank Yurko is now director of the Field Museum, or was, in Chicago. He was a student at the Oriental Institute in Chicago, where you study Egyptology. But the word on the street was that he was never going to get his degree. And so far, I don't think he ever has. But then he, as a junior person, could be run out there to do battle with the Africans. Why do you suppose they did that? Why didn't the full professors of Egyptology come out and do battle with us. Why do you think they didn't? Because in 1974, they tried that. They had all of those great professors in Cairo, at the Cairo Symposium. And Sheikh Anta Jop and Theophil Obinga kicked them from one end of Cairo to the other. Get the UNESCO General History of Africa and read the minutes of the meeting of the Cairo Symposium. And it's very clear that academically, the Africans were the only ones that had anything to say. And that's what the reporter said. He said, everybody who came to this conference knew that this was going to be an academic argument about the race of the ancient Egyptians, whether they're black or white people. She said, but we've been here now for several days, and only Obinga and Jop have done their homework. So there was a real lack of balance in this discussion. In other words, when they got 20 Egyptologists, only two Africans among them, in the same place, looking at the evidence, all the evidence of their critics fell apart. So now, do you think those same people are going to want to come back and do much debating anymore? No. The Temple University Conference, we brought them in there too. They had uh, Brother Malefi and Brother Finch Brother Maulana, and then they had people like Ashtor, the great Assyriologist, Mudimbe, the Negro African who was there. We have videotapes of all of these confrontations, folks. And clearly, we didn't have to go home with our tails between our legs. The videotapes are overwhelming proof of the fact that we can stand our own ground when they get their best up against us. So naturally, the people in those ranks, say, well, God, what are you going to do if you're a scholar? If you're a scholar and you have, uh, you've been studying pottery all your life in Egypt. Uh, maybe you're a scholar, you've been studying architecture all your life in Egypt. And then somebody comes and asks you, are the Egyptians black or white? Your only answer is, I don't know. Because have you studied physical anthropology as well as architecture? See? And if you don't know how to do DNA samples, which they're now doing on mummies, if you don't know how to do physical measurements, and uh, the, uh, the type of measurements that physical anthropologists do in order to identify phenotype, if you don't know how to do those things. So most Egyptologists are not scientists of any kind. I don't know whether you know that or not. That's why they're in such bad shape right now on dating. That's why they got caught off base in dating market. That's why they got caught off base dating certain kinds of temples. That instead of dating, they're, they're, they're half too little, at least. Horamakit is somewhere around 10,000 years ago, and they said five. You know, why did they say five? Because they're trying to find out by using inscriptions. Instead of using geology, instead of using astronomy, instead of using the academic discipline that would give you additional evidence to help you interpret the text 
So right now, Egyptology is in bad shape, no matter who beats up on them, whether it's the African scholars, whether it's the geologists and the seismologists and the astronomers, they're in bad shape. So generally, they keep their mouths shut. How many of the famous Egyptologists have you seen write a technical paper on the phenotype of the ancient Kamite? How many have ever seen one? See? They just don't do it because they are unprepared to do it. And that's why Obenga and Jock, who had the multidisciplinary skills and science in addition to the multidisciplinary social science skills, we're able to integrate all that information and to do things that cannot be published now. All they can do is characterize it. They can say, that's not good. That's not good enough. That's characterizing, not engaging and challenging the documentation. And then, of course, now what we have is academic propaganda. If you read Mary Lefkowitz's book, Not Out of Africa, if you read uh, Lowe's book, uh, forget the exact title of that book that just came out. If you read those books, you'll see they call every name in the book. Lowe's book is a joke. They call, I don't know how many names. If you, if you ever picked up a book on Egypt and you're black, your name is in the book. <laughs> so you're in the bibliography. All the names are out there. Noko is in there, you know. I'm in there. All of us in there, in the book. But the thing that you find is that the citations that are made apparently have not been read. Okay. They're, they're not quoting and said, this is what they said, here's what's wrong. In fact, one of the things they said about my writing is that I said that the study of ancient Kemet, I think I did it in a publication right over here, Phylon, I said, why Kemet? I said the study of ancient Kemet will give us a cultural base from which we can reconstruct our educational process. He said, he even said that. I'm guilty, I said that. And I'll say it again. And it, it is, and it will. See, But that's also scary to people who believe in the supremacy of Western civilization. It's another form of white supremacy. You just say Western, and that means white. Uh, so white civilization is what they're talking about. And they're arguing that that is the only thing that school should be about and through that mechanism to try to establish hegemony and through that mechanism try to destroy the families of African people. Because what holds the family together? What is it that holds your family together? It's when you sit down in the evening and say, we are the Smith family. We came to Atlanta in 1813. We came here and covered wagons. We built mud houses. We did this. We had this money. We lost our money. We got some more money. Got us a farm. We did that. And when the family tells those stories, it pulls them closer together. And so when you say, as African people, before we were enslaved, we were on both continents. <laughs> we were in the African continent. We were already here doing things on our own. And we got stories that we must tell our children because we want our children to identify with us, thank you, not with you. And that's what's scary. It's the family feeling more than the information itself that frightens people because if you have a family, you will not be a victim. That's what the issue is. Recently, we had another uh, shift. It's, it's really funny to watch these shifts. For example, uh, when we first started this battle out, the Egyptologists were st still calling Egypt, Egypt. Now they all call it Kemet. Why do you suppose, if they knew it was Kemet in the first place, why didn't they call it by his name? There's no place where Egypt appears in the text. But the Egyptologists now have a magazine called Kemet. So we were the ones that put that out there, you see? So we moved them to a place because it, their, their position was so absurd, the kind of things that they were saying and still are saying. You know, Brother Mario got me, he blew my mind. He got, got to, he just got mad. He got, he said that we were getting this notion about the mystery system from the Masonic order and so forth. And he said, well, let's just go back and see what the text say. And he can't quit reading. He's finding so many references to the mystery system that the white folks say didn't exist and that the only place we could have understood anything about a mystery education system was to get it from them. Okay. So they're ridiculous. They're standing out there on air 
And this is part of the problem. So they had this one little exhibit, and it was kind of funny to me because for once they pulled together Egyptologists, including the interesting Frank Yerko, uh, in Indianapolis, and there's a little book that's been published called Egypt in Africa. And my article in it is called Are Africans African? <laughs> I mean, why should we even have to sit up and argue whether Africans are Africans or not? Whether they're black or not? Anybody that thinks they're white should put their argument on paper. They don't, they don't put their argument on paper, they challenge ours. They don't challenge it, they characterize it. So the work that ASCAC has to do is extremely serious. Part of what you got to do in order that every time something like this comes up, you don't tie Brother Tony Martin down for the next year building a book to refute a fool, that you don't tie Runoko Rashidi up all time. He's out here trying to find our connection to Australia. They're getting ready to go out there now. He goes over to India. He's digging up information, publishing it. That's what we need. We're going to win just by publishing what we know. That's why we're the only people on the planet whose people are being attacked because they do reading and research. The only people. You know, why do you think we're the only people? Well, because brothers and sisters in other parts of the diaspora have begun to hear and read. <laughs> They've begun to see things that they hadn't seen before. Brothers in South Africa picking up books by Dr. John Henry Clark, Jacob Carruthers. They're picking up these books, and he said, wait a minute, I got to reframe what I thought history was. And they begin to write and they, over on the continent, out in the Caribbean, and places like that. They're doing it everywhere. That's what the problem is. <laughs> because once they begin to do that, the family begins to knit itself back together again. And of course, there's nothing that oppressors fear more than unity among the oppressed. So that's our job. That's a major contribution that somebody else in ASCAC can make to help us pull together and expose the kind of thing that I'm talking about in a formal way. Charts, graphs, books, and publications. That we do more research and publication because that's what's gotten us in trouble in the first place. Well, we're not in trouble. Like Listerfeld was called by this reporter one time. He said, they say that this scholarship that you guys are coming up with is is uh, shoddy and false scholarship. Listerfeld, he, classic statement, classic Listerfeld. I gave him a big hug for it. He said, you know, to the reporter, he says, I talked to a lot of African scholars. He said, I haven't met any of them that are sitting around waiting to be validated by white people. <laughs> he said, I don't know anybody that's waiting for you to tell us we can do this. We're going to do it. So we have to do more. And above all, we need more dissemination. We got to get this stuff out there. Some of y'all are, I mean, you're awesome on the internet. We got to get our stuff out. To put Queen T on the internet and her whole story, you got a home page, put it out there. You know, to put the bibliography out of the books that we need, put it out there. As well as put all this foolishness out. That is the map of the interlocking network of people. That little small group of poot butt people who have nothing but money. Put it out there and let people see it. That's the challenge that I bring to you. I just wanted to say to Sister Nzinga uh, that she knows that the ASCAC family will be right in the middle of the fight. We're not afraid of a fight. <laughs> we love fight. <laughs> African people, African people have a saying in Nigeria, I think it was Brother Chen Wazu that came on out with this thing. He said that, and that Sister Marimba has it in her book too. He said that when you, when you get real full, he said, then you stand out in the street and then you challenge your tormentor. You say, Bukaleja means come on down, let's fight. <laughs> That's what we say now, Bukaleja, because we know where we're going. We know where we've come from. And we know how we're going to get where we're going. Thank you. I'm a runaway soldier.
I'm a runaway slave. I'm a runaway slave. I'm a runaway slave.